Y bueno, os, dejamos, os dejo de nuevo con Hamlet Darcy, con la charla Groove Code Generation. Hamlet, whenever you're ready, you can start. How's the volume for everybody? Because I can speak louder. No? All right. So welcome to Groovy Code Generation. I sincerely hope that you're in the right room. If you're not in the right room, just scoot on out. I won't be, I won't be offended. Uh, my Twitter ID is up here. And I will post the slides to SlideShare and tweet the slides at the end, uh, although the, the network connection here is a little slow, so it might take a little while. And today's agenda, so there's another session as well. So this is the agenda. This is what I'm going to talk about. So pick your session wisely. I believe what I'll talk about is starting off with a whirlwind tour of AST, AST what an abstract syntax tree is, and why an abstract syntax tree is important. We'll look at some AST transformations in Groovy and Java. So we'll look at some of the features in Groovy 1.8. And we'll look at the, the Java, one or two quick Java parallels to show some variety. We'll look at static analysis tools like CodeNARC. CodeNARC is a static analysis tool like uh, FindBugs or PMD is for Java. It tries to find bugs in your code, or it finds style violations, or it finds problems with your code. And it does this not by analyzing the source code of your code, but by analyzing the syntax tree of your code. IntelliJ IDEA works the exact same way. This is how they support their static analysis for Groovy code as well. So we'll take just a brief look at that. We'll look at G contracts and Spock. These are two frameworks built on top of AST, abstract syntax trees. And uh, last, just for some variety, I want to show two or three Mira slides. Mira is another language on the JVM, and I think there is uh, it's a very young language, and it, definitely not saying it's an alternative to Groovy, although it could be, I guess. But I wanted to show some things that other languages have that Groovy does not, and possibly what we might want to think about for the future of Groovy. So that's the agenda. This slide is me and my logos. Uh, I am a, a committer on Groovy and CodeNARC. I'm definitely more active on the CodeNARC side. Uh, I've been really, really involved the last year and a half or two years on trying to make a static analysis tool for Groovy, and it uses a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. If you want more information, the book uh, Groovy in Action is in MEEP. It's, you can get the ebook form right now, and I think the, my chapter in that on AST is 54 pages long, so that's the best resource that there is. Otherwise, there's some blogs and stuff. And also, I'm a, a JetBrains Academy member, so. Uh, I'll be showing some JetBrains tools and, and, uh, and whatnot. So let's start with a joke, or at least a sentence. I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Subject of the sentence is I. Hope you can see this. Subject of the sentence is I. The verb is shot. So I physically shot. Direct object is an elephant. I shot an elephant. And at the end, we have an indirect object, in my pajamas. And this indirect object has to relate all the way back to the subject of the sentence. So this is how a sentence works, in English at least. This is how our mind might construct language. Maybe, maybe not. The linguists are divided. Uh, so that's one reading of this sentence. How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. So when you reveal more information, you find out the elephant was physically in my pajamas. Now, it's the same words in this sentence. I shot an elephant in my pajamas. But now that we've changed the meaning of the sentence, we've constructed the tree of what, how the words fit together differently. We've changed the semantics of the language by reordering the tree. And again, the, uh, the most famous linguist who proposes that this is how language in the mind works is Steven Pinker. Uh, but it's really, this is a representation of how language works. It's probably not really how your mind works. So let's say one more example. We're having a party. We want to make a very fun guest list. Maybe we invite some strippers. These are adult dancers. JFK, John Franklin, John F. Kennedy, past president, and Stalin. So here's our guest list for the party. We is the subject, invited is the verb, and then the participle is the strippers, JFK and Stalin. And of course, if we change this sentence to think of it a different way, Stalin and JFK are actually the strippers. And again, we've changed the semantics of the sentence simply by restructuring the tree. So this is an important concept, especially if you want to manufacture jokes of mediocre value. So 
Let's jump to some computers. Uh, this is how you might represent in a tree 1 plus 1. So there's an operator, the plus sign. We're going to add 1 plus 1. And if you want to walk this tree and compile it down to bytecode, oh, well, it's a stack machine. So I guess you would push 1 to the stack, you'd push 1 to the stack, you'd push plus, and then you would execute on the JVM. If you just want to think about it, there's a plus operation, 1 plus 1. It's a very simple tree representation. They can get more advanced. This would be 1 plus 2 plus 3. And if we walk the tree from left to right, 1 plus 2 plus 3, we have left to right evaluation. Of course, if there's a multiplication sign in there, we have order of precedence rules. So if we want to change how the operators work, we need to change how the tree is constructed. If there's a multiplication in there, we would change the tree to give it a different semantic meaning. And here's an example from Groovy. This is actually an assertion statement. It's going to be assert that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Now we're dealing with real objects and not just words from our language. This is really the objects in Groovy. We have an assertment, assert statement. We have a Boolean expression. We have a binary expression. And that binary expression has an operator, equals equals. And then it has a left-hand side 1 plus 1 and a right-hand side 2. When you compile it down to bytecode, it will be eventually execute in the JVM, it'll be 1 plus 1 equals 2. The certain statements don't return any value, so it would execute and succeed. So this is a Groovy conference. I apologize for showing Java code. I'll show some Groovy code in a minute. This is, this is some very verbose Java. It's just a main method. We have a person object. It's a person class with a name. We set the name and then print it out. This is a very, very simple program. And the AST for this very simple program didn't even fit on a slide. So this is a representation of how an entire program would be modeled using AST. And this is what happens in the compiler. Uh, this is what happens in the Java C compiler. There's a whole class hierarchy for Java, and there's a whole class hierarchy modeling programs uh, as a tree in Groovy. So to just look at what is available in Java, Project Lombok is a library that you can use in Java. And it would take code like this, bean, uh, bean style uh, getters and setters, along with two string equals and hash code. This is plain old Java. If you annotate it with at data from Lombok, the same bytecode is generated. And how this works, of course, is using AST under the covers. You can imagine that if you have a class node and you have several field nodes on it, that you could instantiate a method node, populate it with the right data, add it to the class node, and at the end of the day, you have the exact same thing you have this in a tree form from this as a source form. And there's a whole bunch of annotations in Lombok. Uh, most of them are mirrored in Groovy, so uh, it's more fun to look at the Groovy code, so we'll do that in a minute. Uh, but how this works is there's an annotation processor, and then the whole program is represented as an abstract syntax tree. This is the UML diagram for Java C or the tree structures in Java C. There's some very beautiful symmetry to it. It's very sparse compared to the other ones we'll see in a minute. Uh, but uh, you get these nodes, and once you have a class node object, you can instantiate a field node and add it to it. You can instantiate a method node and add it to it. And that's how, something, that's how you would do something like this in plain old Java. So at the center, you have things called a tree, and then there's statements and expressions. This is fairly common for a lot of languages, Groovy included. Statements do not return a value, a for statement, an assert statement, uh, other statements, a, a while statement. They do not return values. While an expression always evaluates to a value. 1 plus 1 is an expression. You can evaluate it, and it gives you a value. Um, a closure is a closure expression. When you do a closure literal, under the covers, what the Groovy compiler is doing is it's instantiating a closure expression object it's wiring this tree together, and then eventually it's compiling it to bytecode. So there's a lot of objects involved, and the Java code to write um, AST transformations to modify the tree is quite ugly, and it's quite compiler-specific. There's a lot of different compilers for Java. Um, just know that it's complicated. <laughs> so Groovy, uh, Groovy has some of the same features. Uh, Groovy, uh, AST transformations have been part of Groovy since the very first release. When you think about getters and setters, when you think about a class that just has a string property, and under the covers, when you pass that object up to Java, you know, you can call get, uh, in this case, you can call get title and set title on that object. And it's because in the class file, 
when you compile this Groovy code down into a class file, it actually does have get title and set title in the class file. And that's how you get this really great integration between Java and Groovy. Uh, and what happens is, at some point, the Groovy compiler has a class node. This represents a class. And it sees that there's a property node on it called title, and it instantiates two new method nodes, get title and set title. Then it wires it all together, and downstream out comes a dot .class file uh, that you can instantiate and, or, or you can load into the JVM and pass around and uh, do whatever, almost whatever you want to it. So from the very, very beginning, uh, AS, uh, AST transformations have been part of Groovy. What has not been part of Groovy is a framework that lets you as a user tap into the same AST transformation. So in the past, if you had a great idea about a new language feature, what you had to do was download the source code, learn about the compiler, and then write, uh, write hack part of the language. And that's not, uh, there's you know, four or five people in the world that are qualified to do that, and I'm not, I'm not one of them, so I, had, um, I, didn't wanna, I didn't wanna go into it too much. Uh, so it wasn't as interesting. But then with Groovy 1.6, now this is like two releases ago, we got the AST transformation framework. And there's a lot of new transformations in the, uh, in the language. Let's look at uh, something simple like at two string. Big enough for everybody? Yep. So we look at something like at two string. We can annotate uh, a person with it. And then when you call uh, person dot two string, it gives you a nicely formatted representation of your object. Now, if you want it, if you're living in a pure groovy world and you never had to pass anything back up to Java, you could implement this with metaprogramming. You could do it with a meta class. But then, nothing calling into it, if Java was calling this object, it wouldn't see those methods. It wouldn't get dispatched correctly. So, what happens when you add toString to your class? This is, uh, so this is Groovy Council, it ships with Groovy, you've probably seen it, and if not, you probably have it on your disk, it's in the groovy slash bin directory. You can run it. Uh, inspect AST is what we're gonna do. And this is giving me the, um, uh, this is giving me a representation of what the compiler sees. And you can see, well, now you can see here, whoops, you see that there's an object annotated to string. And when we look at the compiler phases and change it to a later phase, you can see that on our actual object, there is a to string method. And there's a lot of code here to determine how to string gets printed out, but this is, what, this is what Java sees. This is what Java executes. So when you're annotating a class with at to string, under the covers, there's something called an AST transformation. Somebody wrote some code to get a hold of a class node and to get a hold of, uh, to, to basically synthesize this type of code, you know, print out the name of the class first and the value and last in the value. Uh, and it generates that code for you. So this is baked into the class file now. So it's not just available to Groovy, but it's available uh, to anybody that consumes your object. So if it's a, you can put this as a spring bean and pass it to a Scala consumer. You can pass it to um, what any language on the JVM is gonna see this, uh, this code. Let's look at a, another one. These are some simple ones. Uh, so that's two string. Um, canonical is, a, is one that if you're creating a lot of domain objects you might wanna use. Uh, canonical is gonna create for us out of a person class with two properties, first and last name, Canonical is going to create a object that adheres to the basic bean specification standard. There'll be getters and setters that are public, the fields will be private, and there'll be an equals, a hash code, and a two string. So if you're working with a domain model and want it easy to work with and have these nice helper methods, uh, at canonical is what you want to use. And when you add at canonical to person, you see that under the covers, you get a tuple constructor. You get a constructor that takes uh, first and last name. Now, mind you, these are default parameters. So you can have a no art constructor. You can have a one art constructor or a two art constructor. And then it also creates for you uh, the hash code method, the equals method, and uh, uh, two string, and some other helper functions that Groovy uses under the covers. 
So this is, this is some pretty standard code generation. This is some, I say standard because it's common. This is some very common code generation and something like Lombok does it for Java. Uh, there's other ASM based tools that can do it for Java. But for Groovy, it's, it's quite easy to do because we'll see how to do it, how to actually create this code uh, in a few minutes. So um, there's a lot of code generation transformations in, in Groovy 1.8. Uh, there's two string equals and hash code. There's canonical, like I said, canonical is just uh, a canonical is just the um, combination of the two. Did is there a question? No. Right back at you. Uh, <laughs> lazy. <laughs> lazy does lazy instantiation. Uh, so if you want to lazy instantiate a field, you would annotate it like this. So here's an event class that has a lazy field. Uh, it's an array list, and that array list is not instantiated until the first time you use it. So on the left-hand side, you see the Groovy code, and on the right-hand side, you see what Java sees, what's actually in the class file. This isn't runtime metaprogramming. It's actually there in the class file. If you look at this thing in a decompiler, it, it shows up. And you can see that uh, it does, um, uh, this is a simplification, but it does uh, correct synchronization. It makes it thread safe, lazy initialization for you. I think to make it thread safe, you have to add the um, volatile keyword. Um, it's a nod, yeah. To get it thread safe, you have to add the volatile keyword. Maybe just uh, synchronizing an, uh, the object instead of this, maybe better. OK, yeah. Um, Let's go to at lazy because I have a real example rather than talk about it. So I have a lazy connection, uh, and we, when we and it shells out to a method called git connection, which doesn't even exist. Yet when I run this, the thing passes. It doesn't throw a null pointer exception or a method not found exception. And we, when we look at this code in the git connection method, if the thing is not null, it returns the connection. Otherwise. It actually goes and instantiates, goes and instantiates the thing. So uh, if you add transient to it, and I always forget if it's transient or volatile. If you add volatile to it, yes. If you add volatile to it, the field is volatile, and you do synchronize on this. Now, synchronizing on the this keyword is frowned upon in some communities. Uh, in my community, it's frowned upon, so we're from the same place, apparently. Um, the problem with the problem with ever well, let me show you the problem with synchronizing on this. If we look at whoops, this is a fun uh, concurrency example. The problem with synchronizing on the this reference is that anybody else in the world that has a reference to your object can also synchronize on it. So if I wanted to give a denial of service attack to your object, all I needed would be a reference. I would grab your reference, I would synchronize on you, and just wait, you know, just sleep forever. And then the first time somebody ever executes your method, you'll synchronize on this, someone else is synchronizing on it, and there's a conflict. So typically, what you want to do with synchronization is internally synchronized on a, on a new object. So here we have a hash map. We have a person with a hash map, phone numbers, and then there's a getter and a setter, and they're both marked at synchronized. And so these two methods will be synchronized for you. But when you look at the code that's generated, it actually generates an internal lock for you, a private lock, and it does not synchronize on the this reference. Just because somebody has a reference to you they can synchronize on you, and it won't interfere with your synchronization policy. When you're synchronizing on this, it's basically making your synchronization policy public to the world, and that's not what you want to do. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at how this object is initialized, I'm not seeing it initialized in this decompiler view, but this lock is actually a zero element array, not just a new object. And that's because a zero element array is serializable and a new object is not serializable. So if you're using at synchronized as a way to do proper or safe synchronization, uh, it, is, it is practically as terse, practically as um, 
uh, you know, little to write as the synchronized keyword, except under the covers is actually doing the right thing for you. And that's a, uh, that's a common theme with a lot of these tr AST transformations is we want to make it in Groovy as easy as possible to make the right decision, to implement it the right way. You know, how do you do proper lazy instantiation of a field in a thread safe way? Well, the answer is actually not, not that obvious. You know, the answer is, um, uh, this is a, a naive example, uh, but the, the, the answer is to, uh, to do proper double check locking, which isn't that simple. And we're doing it for you so you never have to think about it. Same with equals and hash code. If you think about implementing uh, an equals method, I would ask, what's the contract of equals? Well, my IDE generates it for me. Well, well you know, does anybody know offhand the contract of equals? It has to have four properties, the equals method? Nobody? Because you can, I always say, you can tell when people are looking for jobs because this is a question you get asked in a job interview that you don't really use that often in real life. But an equals method has to be transitive, reflective, associative, and I'm not looking for a job, so I can't always forget the fourth one. <laughs> But that's not, but the point is not to memorize that stuff. The point is to use equals and hash code. And it's the same with um, implementing comparable. Yesterday, literally yesterday, I got bitten by uh, a compare to problem. Does anybody know what the contract of comparable is when you pass null to compare to? You're supposed to throw a null pointer exception. I had no idea. Well, we did after we ended up writing some unit tests because we couldn't figure out why our software wouldn't run. But now, uh, now I know. But it doesn't. It's not obvious to me, and that's because I use things like uh, uh, compare to builder from Apache Commons or uh, uh, at comparable from Groovy. So the intent of, from a lot of these transformations, from a user's perspective, is to make the right decision the easy one to make. So let's look at one of my favorite examples. Speaking of making the right decision easy to make, in Java, inheritance is very easy. It's easy to subclass another object. In C++, multiple inheritance is very easy. The quickest way to share behavior between two classes is to implement, is to subclass both of the classes. And then after three months of doing that, it's a nightmare to maintain. So here's a, here's a question for you. This is some inheritance. We have a noisy set. This is an object that extends hash set. And when we add an element, we print out a little message, adding element. And when we add multiple elements, we print out adding element for each element that we're adding. So when I call noisy set dot add all and pass in one, two, three, what prints out at the command line? Any guesses? It prints out adding one, two, three, twice. Why does it print out adding one, two, three, and then adding one, two, three again? And it's because the root problem is that anytime you subclass another class, you're tightly coupled to the implementation of that class. In this case, when we call super.addAll, the superclass dispatches to add. So we're printing out adding one, adding two, adding three. We call super add all, and the super class calls this method three times. That's why we see the double, uh, the double messages. And this is the canonical example of why you should prefer delegation over composition. You shouldn't have to extend hash set. You should make a new set that under the covers has a hash set. And every method on the set interface, you should just dispatch to your delegate, which sounds to Java programmers like a lot of hassle, and it is. It is a lot of hassle. Implements, so how to do this properly is uh, implement set, and then let's do an at delegate. Set delegate equals so instead of dispatching to super, let's go to the delegate. Instead of dispatching to super, let's go to the delegate. And if this works, Oh, my computer's mouse pad is screwed up. If this works, yes, it prints out just adding one, two, three, just once. The question is, how many methods are there on the set interface? Like two dozen, right? How are they implemented? Where are they implemented? And that's why you want to look at the source code of at delegate. And what happens under the covers 
is we have a set that implements set and it has a set as a member and the two methods that we overrode are there but every other method on the set interface was generated for us. Our class dot clear dispatches to delegate dot clear. Our class dot is equal dispatch or is empty dispatches to delegate dot is empty. And to write this by yourself um, is a is a pain to say the least. And it's this type of pain that leads people to subclass when really we should be using delegation. Prefer composition over inheritance is the uh, is the mantra of. Um, uh, of design and this AST transformation in particular generates a lot of code for you so that the right decision delegation is the easiest decision that you can make uh, another just one or two more examples and then we'll look at the guts uh, one that I'm proud of because we wrote up at Basel at our little hacker garden user group is in groovy 1.8 we have a, a log object now at log and this is an enhancement to whatever logging framework you're using, as long as you're using Java Util logging, log4j, SLF4j, or um, uh, Apache logging. So when you annotate a class with the at log annotation, you can do things like this. Here we have a method, log.find. That's a method call on our logger, which isn't really declared anywhere. And we're passing as a parameter run long database query. So. If the fine level is not enabled, then that code doesn't actually run. This, if I run this example, it actually does run, it finishes through, even though this method uh, was never actually defined anywhere. And you could also do, you could also do, uh, um, let's make it a little complex. We can also do five divided by zero. It's a closure. Yep. So log.find, normally, if this were a real logger object, you would, in Java, the Java language specification states when you're calling a method, the parameters are evaluated before they're sent to the method. You're not sending a closure to the method, you're sending the result of the closure. So how do we get away with doing five divided by zero? Which does, I don't know if you've tried this recently, it does result in an exception. What happens when you're adding this at log annotation is first of all, you have a logger. It's declared properly, private static final. It has a name. You can configure the name as an annotation parameter. But every call to this logger is wrapped in a log.isLoggable statement. So all this code that you've written over the years that said if debug is enabled, then log this debug message. If you know, this log level is enabled, then log that message. You don't have to write it anymore. So the at log annotation is not just about making it easier to declare a logger, but also make it easier and remove the boilerplate of, of working with the logger. So like I said, there's four different annotations. There's one called log, which is, common, uh, which is Java util logging. There's one called SLF for J log, or um, the name escapes me. There's, um, so any of the four logging frameworks are supported. And in fact, if you search the internet or ask me for the link, there's an article out there about how to extend it for your, own, for your own log class. So you could extend this to your own classes if you'd like, if you have your own internal framework or some other framework that you're using. Okay, so we looked at, we looked at the at synchronized annotation uh, earlier. And the other one that I really like, uh, uh, and at with write lock. So here you see what happens under the cover is you get a reentrant read write lock, and then you acquire the lock, execute some code, and then in a finally block release it. So this is a nice little abstraction so that the, the concerns of locking and synchronization are not really part of your code. You're just declaring what you want to do and letting the generated code handle doing it for you. There's, there's almost no way to make a mistake with this code. Now what happens, so here we have a getter and a setter being locked. What happens if you have a getter and a setter and you forget to add the annotation to either the getter or the setter? CodeNark complains. So if you forget to, uh, you, might, well, you might have been thinking that, uh, well, that's a defect. Okay, well, it is a defect, and that's why static analysis tools are there to help you. If you have inconsistent locking with at synchronized, synchronized, or at with read write lock, 
uh, CodeNark will complain about all those and find the inconsistencies for you. Of course, there's still ways to screw it up. So everything I've shown you so far is an example of something called a local AST transformation. They're all annotation driven. You annotate your code with something and under the cover some other code gets generated for you. So I showed the UML diagram of Java C's AST. Groovy's AST is quite a bit bigger, uh, but the principles underlying it are very similar. Now the difference is that Groovy has a lot more functionality in its AST. For instance, if you look at something like annotated node, you know you can put annotations a lot more places in Groovy than you can with Java. In Java there's just four places you can put them. With Groovy you can, you can put them almost anywhere. And so almost everything is an annotated node and that's where some of the complexity comes from. But the, the underlying, there are statements. This is statements, right? Yeah, there are statements which do not return a value for statement, assert statement, loop, do while loop statement. And there's expressions, things that do return a value, a ternary expression, a short ternary expression. That's the, uh, the Elvis, um, as you know it. Um, closure expressions. Uh, these are all things that do return a value. So if you wanted to write something like yourself, like this yourself, I said earlier, since Groovy 1.6, this option has been available to you. It's not all that widely used. Uh, a lot of framework writers use it. But as an end, end user, people are just starting to, to adopt it. But if you wanted to write at delegate yourself, there's three things that you need to write. The first thing is you need to write the annotation, at delegate. That's just a standard annotation. You, you, need, you need it to annotate things. So no surprises there. Uh, the first thing you write is at delegate, and you annotate that, and you say this thing is a groovy AST transformation. So the usage is here, you, instant, you declare your annotation, and you say, hey, it's a groovy AST transformation. This is a message to the groovy compiler that when this annotation is found, instantiate this class and call it. And so that's what the AST transformation really is about in a nutshell. And then you would actually write this class, and you would have a visit method, and in there you're handed the AST. So when you annotate a field with at delegate, your visit method at the bottom is called back, and the parameter is a field node. When you annotate a class with at to string, your AST transform, your class here is called back, and it's passed as a parameter the class node. You know, annotate, there's a, there's a lot of places you can annotate things. So that's, in small, how an AST transformation gets wired together. Now, how do you actually write the code? I showed earlier a slide of how to write Java AST, and it was kind of a nightmare of colors. It was a lot of purple and blue, uh, because you, maybe it'll give you black and blue bruises at the end of it. In, in Groovy, it's considerably easier than in Java to write and synthesize AST. If you think in your head, what I want to generate is this nicely formatted equals method and you have it in your head, it's sometimes hard to get it out into tree structure. Of course, the, the most bare bones way to do it is to um, use the raw constructors. I mean, the tree, is, uh, the tree is typed, it's statically typed. So everything in the tree has a type. Like I said, field node, class node, expression statement, all these things. And if you want, you can instantiate them, wire them all together, and then you know, put that back into the tree somewhere. So here's an example of how to make a new date. Now it's very low level. There's a lot of uh, complexity that you need to know about. For instance, um, this is a, you're making a return statement that has a constructor call in it, and the class of it is date. Now there's some class caching that goes on, and you have to use class helper. Um, I won't get into too many of the details. Uh, and for instance, to show empty arguments, you have to special uh, you have to pass a special uh, a special mm, constant to say there's no arguments on this call. So so to write it might sound like it's easy to write the raw constructors to just write this code out, and your IDE will help you with it. But overall, there's a lot of complexity, and you sort of need to know what you're doing. So by hand isn't the best way to write this AST. There's a second way to do it, and this is the AST builder. AST builder is an object that was created to help you write AST. It has a couple methods on its API. The first one I'll talk about is build from spec. This is a DSL or a small DSL for 
building AST. In this case, you would just say, I want a return statement. It has a constructor call to date, and the argument list is empty. So it's a little bit more terse, um, but it's not just that it's less code to type, it's less concepts to worry about. You don't need to worry about something called a class helper, which is doing class node caching for you. Trust me, you don't want to have to worry about that. You also don't need to worry so much about what an empty argument list is. Uh, so it's an abstraction. It's a little bit more abstract from uh, the raw types. And I think Marcin is going to, in his Groovy Coans talk this afternoon, after me, is going to cover some of this. Okay, my bad. I tried to help you, man. Just go, yeah, I'm going to cover it, and then don't. <laughs> say, I ran out of, if I do that again, say, if I have time. <laughs> so, and an even more abstract way to create AST, if you want to synthesize AST, uh, you can do build from string. And in this case, you would just pass in a string into the method, and it would give you back a fully formed tree structure. So this is just a groovy script. In green, you see new date. And this is a Groovy script. And of course, Groovy scripts have a return statement at the end. So actually what it's creating for you is a return statement that returns a constructor call to new date. But the most, so that's a nice abstraction as well. You're only dealing with strings though. There's no syntax highlighting. Uh, um, the nicest abstraction at the end is this build from code uh, alternative, where if you call astbuilder.buildfromcode, Whatever you pass it in the closure block will actually be compiled into AST. It won't be executed and it'll be handed back to you. So if you want to create the AST for new date, you would just call build from code and pass in new date. Now there are uh, some gotchas with doing this. Uh, one of the biggest problems is managing your variable scope, managing how things reference each other. But if you have in your head four or five lines of code that you know you want to synthesize, it's often easiest to put it in a closure like this and just have the, the language do it for you. So one of the practical examples that's checked into the Groovy source code, I, th I think when you download the Groovy zip file and extract it, there's an examples directory. And this is one of the examples in that directory. Uh, it's a at main annotation. And this is, a, this is a working AST transformation that you can go and look at and learn from. Of course, Groovy is open source, so any of the Groovy transformations you can look at as well. Although sometimes things that are written for a feature aren't always the best to use for educational purposes. Sometimes they're not as clear as you would want them. But in this case, we had an at main annotation. And when you annotate a method with it, what happens under the covers is a public static void method, a public static void main method is generated. It's added to the class. And so if you compile main example to main example dot class, That's a dream. Ten minutes is a dream, man. <laughs> stay, stay put. Um, if you run this, it actually calls, if you just run it with Groovy, it actually does print out hello from greet. And when I said earlier that managing variable scope is a problem that you're going to have to fight with, uh, that's true. To generate a public static void method, public static void main method, this is the actual code. I used build from string to create the entire class because then this method has the right parent type and the variable scope's all set up. It's a method within a class. And um, there's a couple other examples as well that are checked in. The comments try to explain why some of this stuff is done. So just because there are some nice abstractions, uh, just be careful that there is some complexity and the mailing list is one of the best places to uh, ask your questions. So two static analysis tools I'll talk about. The first one is IntelliJ IDEA. If you look at IntelliJ IDEA, it gives you warnings for um, certain types of code. Does anybody know what the problem with this statement is? If something is not null and something is a string, this is redundant. Uh, null is ne null instance of anything always returns false. So this was redundant code. And what's happening under the covers is an AST transformation is running. We're in a visitor pattern. We're finding, we're seeing a binary expression. We're seeing the, the expression is the equal equal sign. And we're creating a, an IDE error when that happens. So this is the way the Groovy support works for inspections in IntelliJ IDEA. Now, 
conceptually speaking, it's not hard to think about how you might trap this condition. You're looking for an AST node that has equals equals as its operator, and then you're looking for a left-hand side that's a binary expression, or maybe the right-hand side is an instance of. In reality, when you're writing this code, it's, it's a lot of code to write. This is the actual code of how to trap this condition. And it was a pain, it was a pain to write. It took, it took quite some time. Now to rewrite the code, was quite a bit easier because a lot of the tools, code and arc and idea, they just work off strings. So to rewrite the string uh, was much easier. Well, one of the reasons I bring this up is because JetBrains has a new language that they're not releasing yet, but they have a new language with documentation, and it's called Kotlin. And one of the things Kotlin has is a feature that makes a logic like this code much, much simpler. It's called decomposer patterns, or it's a, it's a uh, pattern matching on steroids. Other languages have this, and I know that there's been talk at various times about trying to add some sort of pattern matching to Groovy. But what this code does is it says, examine this object, and when it's a binary expression, where the left-hand side is an instance of and the right is anything, a wildcard, then do this code, or it's a binary expression and the left-hand side is anything and the right is instance of, so you can decompose the structure of classes and the relationships and what their structure is very, very easily. So in Java 7, we got strings and switches. And I'm here to tell you that that's peanuts. Groovy has regex and switches. But even beyond that, there's things like pattern matching and decomposer patterns that, um, that are even more powerful and can really examine the code uh, in a very short amount of time. CodeNARC works the same way. CodeNARC analyzes the AST. So CodeNARC finds things like dead code. Uh, if you put a g-string as the key of a map, it'll create an error for you because a g-string um, shouldn't be used as a map. You'll probably uh, never be able to get that value back out again. Uh, it looks at things like if you have a method that returns a uh, null, and it's also a method that returns a list or an array, it creates an error for you. Because if you're creating a method that returns a collection, don't return null from it. That forces the client to handle null. Or just return an empty array or an empty collection. And this works for methods or closures, whether you declare the return type or not. So it's doing things like return path analysis, analyzing the structure of this tree, and finding problems for you. So there's 255 more rules uh, other than these. Uh, it's, it's, this product's, I'm, I'm excited about it because I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, but it's growing a lot, and the next version has a lot of performance improvements. So if you haven't tried it recently or you haven't added it to your Grails project, I think it's worthwhile. Um, I won't spend too much time on it, but if you'd like to add it to your Grails project, it's Grails plugin install CodeNARC. That's it. So how it works is I talked about this tree being uh, a very big tree structure. There's all these types. There's class nodes and field nodes and method nodes. And when you have a big tree structure, the way that you want to analyze a tree in Java is typically with a visitor pattern. You're going to do a standard gang of four visitor, and you're going to have an interface somewhere that declares a visit method for every type that's in the tree. So every type in the tree is about 80 or 90 types. You have a visit constructor call expression, visit binary expression, visit closure expression, visit turner expression. So anything, any condition that you want to trap is, is quite easy to find. And there's a lot of helper classes there uh, to make it easy for you to do this. So it's an external tree visitor. This is part of, um, uh, this is just uh, the framework that Groovy gives you. There's a class called class code visitor support, and that's probably the one you want to subclass. But then once you have that tree, it's simply a matter of walking the tree and executing actions when you find what you're looking for. So if you're looking for anything divided by zero, which is clearly an error, uh, it's quite easy to find that. Um, so that's, that's, uh, um, that's how CodeNARC works. Another example that's in the Groovy source code uh, is called an arithmetic shell. This shows you how easy it is to create an embedded language with Groovy. The arithmetic shell I wrote for a client of mine, we needed to expose to a client like a scientific calculator. We thought, well, how do we make a calculator for a client? How are they going to script it? And we thought about using Java CC, and in the end, I wrote a embedded language with Groovy. I wrote a class where you could evaluate one plus one, and under the covers, it was just a Groovy shell. It would evaluate that and return the answer. You could use any of the math imports. 
And in the end, the, in the end today, this example that's, that ships with Groovy, it uses something called compiler customizations, where you can say what I want to whitelist or blacklist. You can say, I want, um, I want to statically import everything from math, and I want to disallow everything else. So if you try to create a new file here, it will be a compile error within the Groovy shell. If you try to create a new socket, if you try to do anything with a string, this is an arithmetic shell, it doesn't operate on strings, it'll be a compile error. So the advantage of writing something like arithmetic shell was that A, it was very easy to do in Groovy, it's just an embedded language. Uh, the documentation, if the customer wanted documentation of how things rounded or whatnot, we'd say, well, here's big decimal, here's big integer, this is how things work. But the advantage is, is much, much safer. If you try to enforce, enforce this at runtime, you have the problem that you're executing code just to make sure that it's valid. And in this case, we were compiling code to make sure it was valid and the compiler was rejecting it early if there was any problems. So SPOC and G-Contracts are two other, uh, two other frameworks that are built on AST transformations. And they show uh, some of the power. Uh, this is a SPOC. So on the back of all your t-shirts is a SPOC spec. And how SPOC works is it's a, uh, it's a testing framework. And one of the great features is it allows you to lay out table-based data. So if you look at a test like this, we're going to run this expectation block once for each row in our table. And without Spock, we're going to execute this from top to bottom and it's going to error out. With just plain old Groovy, this isn't, this isn't valid. But with Spock, it is. And this is what, exactly what Spock does. At the very beginning of the, sh the presentation, I showed some slides that were human language. It showed when you rearrange the tree, it changes the semantics of what you mean. And in the same sense, Spock rearranges the whole tree of what's being compiled to make this code uh, actually run unit tests and, and uh, execute. So it runs, and if you look at what's generated, if you look at what's generated under the covers, if you look at the class file, there are if you look at the class file, eh, it's small. But there is a method generated for does simple math work? And spaces and method names are perfectly fine on the JVM. But then there's also uh, a few helper methods, things like this data table got converted into its own method. And when this test runs, this helper method is being called several times, once for each row in that table. So if you look at the bytecode or look at the decompiler using Groovy Console, you can clearly see how the thing works. But it's not just executing from top to bottom a test method anymore. So what Spock's doing, which is so cool, is it's changing the semantics of the language to mean something very new. It's not changing the syntax. This is syntactically groovy. There's a break label, and these are logical or operators. It's just the meaning, the semantics are changed. This is meaningless groovy code, but it's meaningful Spock code. And under the covers, it's an AST transformation. And the other, um, the other uh, framework I wanted to point out briefly was called G-Contracts. This is contract-driven development for Groovy. And with contract-driven development, it's a design methodology where you would specify how objects behave and what their valid states are. And that's the design process. That's the contract of your object. And it helps you write uh, quality software. So if you look at some of the contracts that are available, you can put invariant on a class. And before and after every method call, this invariant is going to be enforced. If your speed of a rocket, this is a, a modeling a, a rocket, uh, if your speed is ever less than zero, there's a big problem. Your rocket's going backwards. So you can't call any methods on that object, and you can't return from any methods on that object. It's an invalid object. You would fail early and fail fast. Likewise, if you want to specify uh, that if you want to start the engine of a rocket, that you can't start it twice. You may specify the preconditions, what is required to be true for this method to be called, or a postcondition, what you guarantee to be true after the method is called. And the last one is uh, you have the, a snapshot of the state of your object before the method call. So when you're saying, I'm ensuring, after you accelerate, you can ensure that the old speed is less than or equal to uh, the new speed that you actually have accelerated. 
So there's a, a variable called old that's the snapshot of the state at the beginning. And one of the cool things about this framework, other than that it helps you write high quality software, that's probably the coolest thing. Uh, one of the cool things about this framework is it's not all that complex uh, when you conceptualize what it's doing. If you look at G, this same exact um, example in the decompiler, you're seeing that what's happening is your requires annotation is just being written into the start of whatever your method is. So you're actually making some assertions. This is what JVMC is. This is the bytecode of the class. Executing your logic and then making your post condition assertions, your uh, uh, required clause. So these are two ideas that have been implemented. Spock is an idea and G-Contracts is an idea that have been implemented on top of AST transformations. So on one hand, AST transformations are about code generation. They're about generating the boilerplate that you don't want to have to write yourself. And, the, and they're about making the correct design decision, the easiest one. On the second hand, uh, they're about frameworks and uh, using a lot of this internally to a framework to expose features to users. And I know Grails 2.0 uh, has quite a bit of uh, AST transformations in them. And just to close out very quickly with some, uh, some things we haven't seen, Mira is a language that, uh, here's FizzBuzz, this is a popular algorithm in Mira, I mean in Ruby, uh, and the Mira example is exactly the same. So what's the difference between Mira and Ruby? Ruby is dynamically typed and slower, and Mira is statically typed. This has static types with it. Everything in this example is of type integer or of type string, and the compiler enforces that for you. So when we talk about uh, Grumpy and what we should do with static typing, we should also be looking at languages like this. And what Mira does is it compiles to pure Java bytecode. There's no runtime at all. And it also compiles to pure Java source code. So if you wanted to compile this Ruby code into Java source, you can do it with something like uh, Mira, and there's no dependencies whatsoever. So you can use that with Android, you can use that with GWT, use that with anything that just takes Java source or class files as input. You don't have to worry about porting a runtime over. The reason Mira is interesting, other than the technical details and the huge abstract syntax tree class structure, this is simplified in fact, is their macro facility. So I've shown how in Groovy you have to have a local AST transformation, you have to have an annotation, and then you have to have a handler, an annotation handler, and then you have to implement the handler. In Mira and Lisp, for that matter, to write your own AST transformation, you use the macro keyword. And then the compiler handles invoking it all for you. So it's much, it's much more simplified. Uh, you don't have to wire together all these annotations, and there's sort of a consistent and cleaner syntax. So that's exciting for me. How to port this into Groovy, I don't know yet. But this is definitely something that we should be looking at. And the other thing is they had, we had the um, uh, AST builder as a way to generate code. Lisp and Mira as well has a, a quote facility where you can just quote a value and it ge gets generated into code. So uh, there's two things that I like about Mira. Uh, one is that, uh, Mira and Lisp for that matter, one is that calling AST transformations and getting them invoked is easier in other languages. So we need to find a way to improve that in Groovy. And the second thing is uh, generating AST safely without all the edge cases is easier in other languages. So again, we need to find a way to improve that. And with, once you have macros, you can quite easily make a getter and setter generation. This is the getter and setter generation from Mira, and this is the macro that does it. And compare that with quite a bit of code uh, even in a Groovy AST transformation. So, um, oh, last thing. Uh, so, I, I think in my mind, AST transformations in Groovy are, are more framework oriented. They're good for writing frameworks. They're good for writing this code generation stuff. But you do have to get your hands dirty and learn how to do it. Like I said, there's 54 pages in Groovy in action if you want to get very dirty. Uh, and macros, which is maybe the future, I, I say maybe, is a, a little more function specific. The compiler handles your invocation a lot easier and it's easier to write little bits and pieces of compiler extensions rather than making a big commitment. So that's the, that's the talk. Uh, you know, I did, I gave, a, AS, I hope you walk away with a sense of what AST is and why it's important and how it shapes the semantics of our language. But I also hope you walk away with some ideas about some new tools you can use at work, whether it's Spock or G-Contracts, uh, or CodeNARC for that matter. 
And if you have questions about AST, you can always grab me and ask me, or you can email me, or you can ask the Groovy mailing list, although emailing me is, is pretty good because I'm, I'm sometimes busy and don't follow the list. So that's, that's the agenda. What to do next? Bring your creativity and patience. It's, it's still, even though it's Groovy 1.8 and it's been there a few releases, um, it's still, you know, there's still some complexity to it. So the Groovy Wiki is good. The mailing list is very, very helpful. Uh, and if you have an idea for writing new transformations, it's good to talk about them first with people who are experienced. So float your idea on the mailing list, get ideas about how you want to make your AST transformations, and then go, go and generate uh, however much code you want. So questions. And like I said earlier, you may ask questions. I will try to answer. No answers promised. ¿Alguna pregunta? Who, who would rather have an espresso than ask a question? <laughs> Don't let me dissuade you. Ninguna pregunta? I have a question. So I will let you go and get espresso in a minute. But um, uh, so how many people think they're actually going to write or try to write an AST transformation? That's about half the room. That's, you know, if I had asked that like two years ago when the feature was available, it would have been two or three people. So I think interest is, is growing a lot and I'm seeing a lot more blog posts. Um, if you subscribe to DZone every few weeks, you'll see an AST transformation blog post. But um, Google's your friend. Between a few bloggers, there's people documenting this and, and trying to get it done. But otherwise, really, there's 54 pages in that Groovy in Action book and it really clear, well, as clearly as I could, spells out the gotchas and the details and how to do everything. So. Um, that's a, that's going to be your best resource, more more so than finding blog posts and reading the wiki. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Hamlet. My weekend is about to start. Put your hand out. It's my weekend. <laughs> no, you can. Uh, so uh, I've worked on on a plugin that uh, uses AST transformations, and I found that uh, some. Uh, of the DSLs that you can use to to transform the the class nodes and so on uh, are better proposed for uh, maybe um, adding a method or adding a property. So, uh, in your experience, uh, is there any preferred way to maybe add a method or a property? Yeah, because I I've yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is the second time I've gotten this question today, is when you have, so you can instantiate a class called field node, and you can have a class called class node, and you can add the field to the class and it doesn't work. And, and wiring things together is difficult because of scopes. And if you look at any object-oriented software, well, a lot, no. Let's get through the, okay. If you look at object-oriented software, there's a lot of complexity to managing scope. There is a static scope here. There's, well, there's static scope here between the methods. There's method scope here, local variables. There's parameter scope. Uh, there's class scope, instant fields. And how these things all relate to each other is one of the hard parts about writing an OO language. And so there's an object in Groovy called variable scope, and, there's, and classes fields have owners. And so making sure that these owners all line up together is very difficult. And so, uh, so beyond really trying to understand how these things fit together, today there's no good answer of why is it hard to add fields to classes? Why is it hard to add methods to classes? Because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work and you're not clear why. Um, so this is why the last slide says the mailing list is your friend. You know, talk about, or it says the mailing list is amazingly helpful. You know, talk about your idea on the mailing list and try to get the input from them, from the people on the list. And I'm not so active in the last couple months there, uh, but I can try to be. So, uh, you know, we're trying to steadily improve it, but it is hard and variable scope is one of the major problems. It's a, it's a problem with OO software, not just Groovy. There's a problem. Espresso. <laughs> Well, I think your weekend is starting right now. So let's thank Hamlet. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.